everyone. It's loud. It's very intimidating to see you all here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so we'll, we'll begin. Uh, firstly, a brief outline of what you can sort of expect to take away today. Uh, first up, an introduction to uh, data stream learning. Um, all of the new people in AI like to call it AI, and all of the old people call it machine learning still. Uh, and putting AI in the, in, in, in the title convinced you all to show up, but now I'm going to call it machine learning. It's a switcheroo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's going it's to be very high level because it's a, it's a niche within a niche, but hopefully some of you have some problems and we have some solutions. And uh, we're also going to introduce you all to the, some of the work that I've been working on, this Cappy Moa thing, uh, which is a new open source uh, data stream learning library, uh, which the New Zealand taxpayer helped pay for through research grants. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and also we're going to talk about a bit about how we uh, built Cappy Moa, because uh, it's got some interesting technicalities to it, and hopefully if you're not, uh, if you can't take away anything else, there's some interesting Python uh, development uh, behind it. So first up, what is this machine learning thing? Um, it's when you have a, uh, you have some data and you want to learn some patterns and relationships from it. And you, importantly, you want to do that automatically. And you do that so you can make some sort of useful decision. Uh, so let's hear some brief examples. Uh, is this network traffic malicious? Uh, if you're doing cybersecurity, you have a bunch of network traffic coming through. Is the data I'm looking at right now dangerous? Uh, what is the next word in this sentence? This is chat GPT. Uh, and will tomorrow be cold? You know, basic things. Uh, but the idea is you're doing this by looking at data. And then finally, what breed of dog is this? <laughs> uh, uh, the AI might struggle with that. When I was putting this slide together, I uh, searched for dog in my phone and forgot I had this picture. <laughs> uh, so stream learning is a niche within machine learning, and the goal of stream learning is to learn uh, patterns uh, and to make decisions from a stream of data that's just being fired at you. It's, uh, it's rapid, it's coming in real time, and you want to make decisions as quickly as possible. And one of the sort of interesting things about data streams is that the underlying relationships in this data might change. And this is what we call concept drift. So sometimes the world changes, uh, <laughs> and the patterns and relationships in the data change, and you're not always going to be able to uh, predict those changes from the data that you're collecting. Uh, so some examples are fashion trends, uh, sensor failures, viral trends, and COVID-19. Uh, so here's a lovely graph of the 2020 car traffic volume on State Highway 1 uh, near Wellington. If you were looking at it in January, uh, you'd probably predict February well, um, and then you'd be a bit confused in uh, March and April about what, what, what happens. Uh, we have all this history of what car traffic's like in March and April, and it's not matching at all. So this is why it's really important to be able to detect concept drift, and this is something that uh, data stream learning and all of the research in this field gives you, is an ability to uh, you know, quickly adapt to changes in the world. So why should you use stream learning? It's, it's, not, it's, a, it's a tool, it's useful for a particular set of problems. Uh, one of the use cases is when you cannot store all the data because storing all the data is too expensive or is not possible. In data stream learning, the sort of main technical constraint is you only want to look at an item of data once, so like a sensor reading once, and then you don't really care where it goes. It might be saved somewhere, or uh, yeah, it, you, don't worry, you don't care where it goes once you've looked at it, and you're trying to make decisions about it in real time. 
so things like network traffic metadata, IoT sensor data, um, it might be not reasonable to store it all. And then the second case where you might, want to might not want to store all the data is when you have privacy concerns. So there's plenty of data that you can collect that you shouldn't keep around, uh, but you also might want to make decisions on that data, and that's where data stream learning might be useful. Uh, so financial data, smart homes, and then the final sort of category is when it's not worth storing the data, but it is useful for making decisions. Uh, so again, if you have a sensor that collects like the light in a room, uh, that's very useful right now, but you don't want to keep that around for five, ten years. Uh, so stream learning is a way of using that and incorporating other data streams to make useful decisions now, but you don't really care about it in the very long term future. And data stream learning also gives you some tools for sort of aggregating data in a really efficient way. So this is, so why Capimoa? Why are we making this new thing? Uh, this is sort of a history of uh, the data stream learning niche. Uh, so it's very useful when you're, <laughs> uh, it's useful when you're trying to make a new thing to look at what's come before and ask yourself, do we need this? Is it, is, are we adding anything to the community? Uh, and that's why I have this lovely XKCD comic, which I'm sure lots of you are familiar with, about when you try to make a new standard or a new way of doing things, you've just contributed to these competing uh, standards. So early on, we have this uh, massive online analysis platform, which uh, some of the people that have worked with me on Capimoa also worked on. Uh, and it, but it's in, it's in Java, and Java doesn't benefit from sort of the explosion in the machine learning ecosystem. We have tools like uh, scikit-learn, PyTorch, and plenty of tools for hyperparameter optimization and all of these machine learning problems. And then the next tool, which is still, people still use all of these tools, even scikit Flow, which has been deprecated. It doesn't work with the latest versions of NumPy. But it's still very popular because the sort of replacement for it is slow. <laughs> so people go back a step and use that. Uh, so Capimoa oh, sort of benefits from the Python ecosystem, but it also benefits from uh, all of these, uh, from the MOA framework. It's talking to MOA for some of it, its algorithms. Um, but it's sort of bringing us into Python. And this is how we achieve Kakimoto's goals, which is efficiency. It needs, to be it needs to be fast, because it needs to be faster than any sort of data stream you might want to chuck at it. Um, so it's a couple thousand a second. And it needs to be interoperable, because the whole point of moving to Python is to have this big ecosystem. Uh, and it also lets us avoid reinventing the wheel because we have access to these uh, old algorithms from NOAA, from MOA, and these algorithms from scikit-learn and from PyTorch, and we're sort of <laughs> taking all of that, putting it together, and giving it a unified API to make it easy for people to use. And it needs to be accessible. It's one of the issues with some of these older frameworks, especially MOA, is that uh, they're quite convoluted to use. You have to really uh, understand it and have worked with it a while to use its uh, API. And then finally is flexibility, uh, which is there's lots of, <laughs> within the niche of uh, stream learning, there's different, there's a, there's, a, there's a thousand different ways to do it and there's a thousand different problems to solve within that. And we want to have uh, cater to a broad selection of those because a lot of the people who are working on Capimo with us are researchers, so th they have specific niches that they're interested in. So we're efficient, we're very fast. Uh, we're, we're beating this river thing. Uh, I actually have uh, memory, well, nightmares from when I was doing my undergrad of. Uh, uh, 
I was doing a data stream learning course, and to implement an algorithm, I implemented it in Python, because Python's great. You would all agree. <laughs> Uh, but uh, using River made it very slow. Uh, so I left my computer running overnight uh, in my room where I was trying to sleep, and it was like, whirr. Uh, yeah. But as you can see, when you use KVMO, it's much quicker. Part of that is because we're using algorithms from MOA, and these algorithms have been around a while, and they're in Java, so they're, f they're quicker in Java. And also, they've been optimized a lot. Like a lot of effort has gone into making these the best that they can be. And it's hard to sort of match that effort if you were to do it again from scratch. But because they've been around for like 20 years, so I shouldn't go back. That's. Um, so, Capping Moa has lots of features, uh, it's taking advantage of this big ecosystem. Uh, and it also has the advantage of wrapping some things that are in Java and MOA. So we have neural networks with PyTorch. We have a few built-in data sets, and we're likely to get some more. Uh, it simplifies implementation, and importantly for research, evaluation of these algorithms to see uh, what their pros and cons are. Currently, it's got 20 classifiers, so that's when you need to uh, take an instance of data and classify it into groups. Is it a cat? Is it a dog? It has uh, nine regressors. That's when you have uh, an instance, and it has an associated value, so like how expensive it is. And we have three anomaly detectors at the moment. This is sort of like outlier detection. Is this instance of data abnormal or different in any way? And we have 11 concept drift detectors. So these are those methods for detecting when you have a sudden change in, or not even sudden, a change in the underlying relationships in the data. And we have some tools for simulating that. So this is an early prototype of how we interact with MOA in Python using JPipe. Uh, so at the top, it's starting the JVM, which is the uh, runtime for the Java language. And then JPipe lets you just import things as if they were Python objects, right? So this moa.classifiers.lazy doesn't exist in Python. It's, it's been added by JPipe. Uh, that's why it comes after the JPipe is started. And then you can sort of see some of the steps that you have to do to get uh, even a basic thing running in, uh, in, in MOA. Manipulate with them. Uh. Yeah, and as I've sort of said, the reason that we're wanting to use MOA is because it's this mature thing. It's trusted. People use it. Uh, it's had plenty of chances to break. Uh, so, looking at this, do your companies have any? Uh, it, it's, it's a good excuse to. You might have some Java code, and you're like, I don't want to write Java anymore. Uh, JPipe might be a good excuse to look at uh, orchestrating it in Python, where we'd all prefer to be. Uh, yeah, so going from that sort of complicated example, this is the API as it currently is for using Kathy Moa. Uh, yeah, so Kathy Moa will automatically start the Java virtual machine when you first import it, all of the Underlying MOA objects are still there for the five people that understand MOA. Uh, and not every algorithm is Java-based, and this is <laughs> very important because there's all of these new deep learning things that we want to take advantage of in data stream learning. Uh, so this is one of the use cases for uh, doing this, is you can have your, it's, it's very common to have ensemble methods, which is where you combine multiple learning algorithms together, and they sort of vote. Um, and it sort of lets you have like a diverse population of learners, and they all have different opinions, and they're better at certain areas of the data, and you can sort of average away any uh, bias. Uh, so this is an example of that, and it benefits from the speed of the underlying algorithms, uh, while it's much easier to orchestrate in Python. So one of the things that 
was very uh, important to me was having autocomplete because I, I love it. Uh, I'm sure lots of you do too. Uh, so I was like, is there a way to get autocomplete for these Java objects? And it turns out there is, and it's, it's amazing. Uh, so we're packaging the MOA Java library. Uh, it's also packaged with some stub information that give us type information for uh, Java. Uh, although I say this, end users probably shouldn't be interacting with the Java because it's still a bit, uh, it has some sharp edges, and we're doing a lot of work to uh, shave them away in the main API that we want people to use. Uh, this is sort of one of the uh, technical solutions we had to come up with is you have some Java algorithms and you have some Python algorithms and they want a slightly different data format. Uh, so this is our instance class, which is just an item of data. Uh, and it has some methods for creating it sort of from the Java side and from the Python side and then interfaces uh, to get uh, get the instance in either the Java format or in the Python format. Uh, and it's lazy and it's cached, so it's quick and it's very easy to use. Uh, one of the very important things about uh, doing this sort of thing, it was sort of in academia, is keeping it documented because it's, uh, people will document things for a tutorial or a workshop and then forget about it. <laughs> And then in five years, it will come back to the documentation, and it, it, it won't work anymore. Uh, so our solution to this was to use Jupyter Notebooks. And we use this tool called nvmake to run those Jupyter Notebooks um, periodically when we make up a change. Yeah. And the advantage is when someone's preparing a workshop that uses Cathy Moa, uh, they'll normally make a big notebook and some slides, and we can just add this notebook to our documentation and use it on our website and also uh, run it as if it were sort of a unit test. And there's tools for doing things you'd want to do, like uh, skip particularly slow cells and hide cells from showing up in the documentation. Uh, so it's not just me. There's a bunch of uh, researchers and people contributing to it. Uh, yeah. Any questions? Okay, so just as a reminder, questions are for if you want more information from Anton, not for sharing your own information. If you have a question, raise your hand and I will eat you the cube. Oh, short throw this time. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, you mentioned that uh, there is some friction in ty data types and whatnot moving between Python and Java when you've got to get to MOA. Um, how big a deal is it to re-implement MOA in a language that doesn't have that friction? Do I either to reproduce the algorithms in a, a C or a Python or a Cython or whatever? Like, I'm not, not saying it's your project and I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but like, is, it, is there something inherent about Java that is why it hasn't been converted to a language that plays nicer with other ecosystems. There's, it's mostly just lack of incentive, right? Uh, occasionally, someone will implement a particularly significant algorithm. Uh, so uh, it's like a random forests uh, appear in all sorts of languages. Some people try to do them uh, in Rust. There's some C++ examples. And there's some, there's some good Python examples. But then there's all of these, because uh, <laughs> it's, sort of, it's sort of a kaleidoscope of different uh, research domains, right? And once you get down to the very, uh, when, you, when you get to the more niche ones, there's very little incentive to go back and reproduce someone's work. And uh, these algorithms tend to be very technical, and they're not there. Uh, you, need, you need a lot of, knowledge and background information, and you need to read their paper, read their code, and go back and forth between that a lot of times. And if they do, yeah. So it, it's just, it's sort of hard, and there's uh, no need to do it. Uh, so this is sort of our uh, hack, which we think sort of gives us the 
best of both worlds without having to redo everything. Sure, thanks. Next question, we've got one up behind you there, and then next one behind that person. <laughs> Good catch. Which way is it, this way? Hello. Um, so, my interpretation of uh, Kapi Mawa is that it's kind of a way of ensembling, collecting, um, like kind of having Python bindings to things that aren't necessarily implemented in Python. Um, so, this is in front of uh, Moa at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. Is there any scope for uh, or things that are implemented in other languages um, as well? Or is it mainly just Java and hook hooking up for things in Java and, for example, Python, things in PyTorch that are implemented in C behind the scenes? Um, not at the moment because I'm not really aware of uh, any other big projects in data stream learning that implement methods. Uh, yeah, I, it, it's something we'd like to look at though because uh, someone has put a lot of effort into implementing a Rust version of a particularly influential algorithm. So it might be nice to have that. Uh, so, so the ones within data stream specifically, it tends to be just Java or Python? Yeah, Java or Python and sometimes MATLAB. <laughs> Uh, so the person directly in front of you, did you have a question as well? Yes, thanks. Hello, thanks very much for the talk. Um, one question I have, just in terms of, I guess, the, the future of these projects, is the intent that more things would still be built into MOA, that you'd then be able to leverage from Capy MOA, or would you, is it more now you want to be building things in, say, Python and, and Rust and, and kind of slowly moving things out of the original MOA? Yeah, so uh, this is an interesting question. Uh, we, we do have to, we want to keep MOA alive because it, it has like a GUI and people still use it. Um, but we also, and to do Cafe MOA, we've had to sort of make some changes. So we do quite a lot of work to uh, get those changes uh, put into the, the main branch just to make it easier on ourselves. Uh, what was the other bit of your question? I, I guess just does it... Um yeah, if, if you were making new, if people are making new algorithms and yeah. or improving algorithms going forward, would they would they be going into MOA or more into Capy MOA? Well, it depends on what the researcher wants to do, right? Because uh, it's it's very hard to reproduce someone else's uh, research. So ideally, they would uh, contribute it to whatever they want to contribute it to. Uh, I. Yeah, and depending on speed, they might want to do it in Java um, or Python or something else at some point. <laughs> Thanks very much. Okay, if we have a question from the back, uh, just over here, I think that's our hand. Yep. Thank you. Uh, so with stream learning, uh, is there much data engineering involved? Because you get a stream of data and you don't have enough enough uh, preparation to do, right? And also. Uh, are these algorithms like specifically like specific hardware bound like CPU, GPU, or can I do it at home basically? Um, so some of our algorithms are GPU accelerated. Uh, so, but, but you can run them on just CPU. Uh, but those are just the ones that use deep learning. At the moment, we don't really support um, like a modular way to install it where you say, I don't want this set of algorithms because I don't want to do any deep learning. Um, and we probably won't support that. Uh, and the other part of the question was about the sort of data engineering side. Yeah, and uh, the sort of like big project we're part of has some data engineering people doing some really interesting things. Uh, with like uh, some project that was doing, they were measuring uh, trees growing and also measuring the temperature of soil and they're chucking that into a big uh, Kafka stream. Uh, so at the moment, most of our, uh, our our data normally comes from a file that's stored somewhere because that's what researchers want to do because that's reproducible. But at some point, we'd like to have ways of integrating with uh, like just drawing stuff from Kafka or from um, other uh, data streams. All right, more questions? Do we have any hands? We've got that one over there. If you can try and make that throw. Hey, good catch. Hi there, yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, interested in how the 
how Java and Python tie together, like how efficient it is. Do you have streams bouncing back and forth between, uh, keep the performance working, that kind of thing? Yeah, so I'm not uh, particularly sure about some of the technical details here. I think, if I recall, it goes through C in the middle there, um, but it, that really comes down to this JPipe project, uh, and they seem to be doing a, doing a good job. Uh, and it's, it, 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 it's only a little bit slower if we go to the performance. Uh, so, mower versus Cappy mower. Uh, this is a little bit of overhead. Any more questions? All the way up here. Give you the best shot. There we go. <laughs> Cheers. Uh, I was wondering, so in the beginning of the talk, you described that there's just basically too much data to store uh, when you're running these kind of workloads. And I was curious, what is a, a decent policy for storing enough data to be training? Because you're dealing with a lot of, of machine learning. Well, the thing with uh, data streams, you don't need to keep any data. Because the idea is that you just learn from the stream of data. But in practice, you'll probably want to keep some data. Um, just because it's valuable uh, and it's fairly cheap to store it nowadays. But the advantage of data streams is you can uh, process it very quickly. Uh, you don't have to do any fancy distributed map reduce or anything because it's just a very fast algorithm that only needs to look at it once. So in lots of ways, it's much faster than uh, those alternatives. So the idea is that when you have to capture enough entropy, there's so much data in your, in your recent stream that you don't need to go back anyway. Yeah, so some methods will look at, well, it, it's part of the research is how much of a window do I keep and what sort of summary statistics am I keeping? Yeah. Awesome, so thank you. It's a very interesting question. You come talk to me later. <laughs> any more? Do we have any here down the front in the middle? Yeet. So what's going on with River here? Um, well, this is a little bit unfair to River because it's a, an ensemble method. So this is actually 100 learners. Uh, so any of the disadvantages in the overhead, uh, primarily because they're storing their data in dictionaries rather than uh, just like a vector, um, means it tends to be slower because there's a lot of uh, transformations that need to come from the stream of dictionaries to a vector and then back and forth. And then that's multiplied by 100 times. <laughs> uh, but yeah, 100 is not an unreasonable amount for an ensemble. It, it's, yeah, 